Welcome to Founder Stories. I'm Mike Abbott. With me today, I have Tony Tam, uh, co-founder and CEO of Reverb. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming on. So tell us a little about Reverb first. Sure, yeah. So Reverb is a uh, text and content discovery app, and we do an extremely good job at personalizing and figuring out what people are interested in. Uh, one of the things that we strive to do is provide serendipity, so it's not the filter bubble that people get stuck in when they search for certain things and then all of, all of a sudden you're stuck in a certain mode. What we think is that life and content, and something I'm going to come back to many times as we talk today, is that serendipity is very important in, in the discovery of anything. So we've, reached, we've launched our iPad app and it's our first view under our engine that acts to uh, passively personalize uh, a content experience. Now, kind of going back in time, when you first co-founded the company, uh, how many years ago? Four? The company is oh, almost five years five, ago. Almost five yeah. years ago. Now, the initial product, which mo most of your products based on, was different. Yeah. Tell us a bit about that, and then you know what kind of drove changing? Because originally you were also the CTO. Yes. So our company has a fascinating background, and I would also say it's probably non-reproducible, but it's worth going over <laughs> what, what that every is. Every entrepreneur thinks. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. So my uh, world is the craziest. Yeah. No one else is this crazy. I don't know if it's crazy, but it's certainly irreproducible. So um, our company actually was founded at TED. So um, Aaron McKean, who's a uh, famous lexicographer, expert in the field, gave a talk about dictionaries and why dictionaries haven't changed in 400 years and computers should do a better job at replacing some of the deficiencies. And it's not just putting a dictionary online. This is like, what, what is it that, that makes content get into the dictionary itself? And that's a lexicographer. And lexicographer is an awesome term. Uh, it's worth 30 points in Scrabble. And it <laughs> will wreck any party if you say it. But um, the idea was that she had this concept of, let's use computers to replace my job. And in the audience was a visionary uh, investor, Roger McNamee. And right after her talk, he pulled her aside and said, how would you do this? And from that, a year of discussion ensued. And he and Steve Anderson from Baseline Ventures um, seed funded a company. I came, and uh, Aaron and, um, and a couple other folks made a proof of concept. And I came on a year later to make it work. So the reason why I say our company is, uh, our path is not that reproducible is that mm. first you have to get on TED, right? <laughs> <laughs> you have to have a visionary C, yeah. uh, investor in the yeah. audience. And there's this pa portion of serendipity in this process that makes it come out the way it did. So um, we started a, a company with this idea. It was really a concept of how can you, someone understand any word in English, whether it's new or just appeared on Twitter or it's used in, by some famous author, how can you figure out what it means? And we spent a year and a half building Wardnik, which is still the world's largest online dictionary, which strives to figure out what words mean. Now, that is a technology and not a product. And we did a very good job at, of it and decided through other experiences that we are very good at a certain type of technology, which is um, both understanding content at a very deep level, not just the, these keywords appear here, not just uh, these people clicked on this and so they might like this, but really saying that in an article, we know what the concepts are in an article. From understanding that, then we can understand what is related and what should be read. And we learned how to apply those techniques to people to personalize the process. So our roots and our DNA, which is really important in any company, is around words and what it means. And through that path, you know, we started with technology and then I took over as CEO to become a product, right? So to turn this into a product, which is a, it's, which is a, a very interesting path to go. And I mean, as you kind of move from the role of CTO to CEO, what have, what have been some of the surprises Yo. that now you're not just running engineering, running all the other oh, aspects shoot. of a business? It's easy running businesses. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think there's a, a couple of things that are surprising and, and it really changes your perspective on, on what you do. So at first, when you start a company and you get some funding, you think, okay, well, what I do affects me and makes my investors happy or not. When you're in charge of the company, every decision you make affects everyone in the company, right? So you now have many responsibilities. There are many people to make happy. There are many people who won't be happy if you fail. And the responsibility in, in every decision you make is surprisingly big, right? So I have to think about uh, a bunch of different things, not just what database do we use, but how do we support this? Can you hire people for this technology? What will it look like in 10 years, right? What is your executive team 
how do they all fit together? Do they work together and that sort of thing? And it's, 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 a, it's a very interesting but a completely different challenge. Was that realization a function of some uh, uh, decisions you made early on that you didn't realize the implications of? Yeah, absolutely. So, so what were some of those? Well, so for example, when, when I was just doing technology, I could make crazy gambles, right? Now, they certainly matter a lot, and I would spend a lot of time figuring out, uh, should we use this database, for example? Um, should we build a, a service architecture? Should we be in the cloud? Should we not? That sort of thing. But the importance of um, DNA between uh, both the founders and the rest of the company when you're bringing senior people in is absolutely critical. And one thing that I've found is that, um, and you'll, you've heard this a million times, which is you should never rush to bring in somebody into a senior position. You should never be in a hurry to do so. I have been in a hurry in the past, and I've learned to not do that anymore. But the, the understanding that people and the company and the vision are compatible is the CEO's job. And if you don't get that right, you're going to have a lot of unhappy people. Mm -hmm. So I've spent a lot of time learning the best way to get that done. Makes sense. I'm going to switch topics here pretty sure. dramatically. So one of the things that that your company has developed is an open source framework around Swagger, and um, you know different startups kind of struggle with you know what is the role of open source? You have employees who want to contribute. You guys created this project. I'd love to hear a little bit about why you decided the open source, and then how that's played into positively or, or not like recruiting. Right. Good question. So um, yeah, like you mentioned, we created in 2009. A framework called Swagger, and this was part of uh, an early bet that we took, um, which was saying we should use APIs for everything. And I know APIs are the big buzz, and when I say API, I mean REST APIs. Um, and we had technical challenges. I mean, we have a bunch of servers, we had no ops people, and we had to build a technology that would help us develop faster. And that was really the genesis of Swagger. If you think about companies that made early bets into technology, um, Google had to make MapReduce, right? They didn't do it because they said, hey, well, let's make something cool. They had a need. And in our case, we had a need to connect computers. We also had a need to con connect other devices to computers. And so we created this framework called Swagger. And um, we actually weren't thinking of open sourcing it until a lot of people reached out to us and said, hey, this documentation system you have is great because they saw it on our developer mm -hmm. site. Would you please open source it? And we thought, well, why not, right? Now, that's a, that sounds like, you know, okay, sure, let's just do this, right? Not really thinking a lot about the implications of open source because it's like a, it's, a, it's something you have to nurture, it's something you have to maintain. And to us, it's been hugely valuable, not only because it's an enabling technology for us, it helps people understand that in order to do what we do, understanding content and words is really hard. It's so hard that we had to develop this framework for distributing all of our computing across hundreds of servers, making them self-discoverable and self-aware and that sort of thing. It's also helped us reach developers, and we have you know, almost 14,000 developers against our APIs, because they see that there's technology behind it. It's not, it's not just some simple you know, two-tier app that got thrown together, or, together on a weekend. It's something we spent a lot of time on. And it gives us a way to, to recruit, frankly. And we've recruited some of our best people have come in because they've seen either um, things about Swagger or talks about NoSQL databases or that sort of thing. It's a, it's a community that any startup that is in the technology space just can't ignore. Mm -hmm. Microsoft I think you make a really good point, though, that it's a real investment. I know it when is, I absolutely. joined Twitter, there were some pieces that were open sourced, but we didn't have anyone really guiding the community. So I recruited someone to do that who's still there today to like really drive the Twitter open source piece, which mm -hmm. and has been fan fantastic for recruiting as well. Hugely valuable. But you, the key is being intentional about why you're mm -hmm. open sourcing and like, you know, are you going to get changes back or is it really just you know, for recruiting sure. or whatnot? Yeah, it's, it's interesting too, the nurturing of the community. So we have, um, you know, we're on GitHub, we have IRC rooms, we have uh, mailing lists, we have Google groups, like all these different places and everyone has an opinion how this should work, right? The nice thing about a company like us is that um, in that space, we're really neutral, right? We're not intending on monetizing this framework. We're doing it to expose our services, and eventually there'll be an angle where Reverb will expose a lot of things through this framework, and we've already got the, the, um, the technology to do mm -hmm. so. But it's fascinating because back to serendipity, I mean, 
someone asks a question in a chat room and it turns out that they're looking at deploying Swagger across one of the top 10 largest software companies in the world, right? And if you just think, yeah, it's just some other guy and you're kind of cocky about it, um, you'll lose that, right? But it turns out we actually answered this question and now it's happened, right? So it's a fascinating thing and it's just like, one of the things I, I tell people, even in the company, my friends and that sort that are starting companies, you have to position yourself where you can benefit from serendipity, right? It's a strange parallel to our app, which is all about serendipity. But if you're not out in the world, if you're not out with open source, you're not in that set of developers, you won't find like our lead architect. You won't find the guy who wrote Tomcat. You won't find these guys and have them want to join your company. It's extremely important and I think any technical co-founder or founder needs to stay with it and, and not ignore the importance of it. Knowing the, that you're very strong technically, as you've taken over the CEO, how have you kind of resisted being the, the guy, since you're probably one of the few people who know how the entire system works, to going in and fixing things, or yeah. does that the, theoretically still happen? It, it, no, so um, the trick is you have to hire people that you trust, and you have to give them the th authority to do the right thing, right? That doesn't say that I don't go hack like crazy, but I leave that stuff to them. That's their responsibility. If I just come in and, and fix stuff, right, it takes away from their, their authority, their responsibility in the product and the platform. It's not the right thing to do. Now, I do say, however, that any technical founder has to keep hacking, right? And you don't come to being a technical founder by not experimenting. And it's a very important part, I think, of my personality. Maybe it's a flaw, maybe it's an asset, we'll see, right? But I think it's important that, that you don't just say, okay, this is it. Uh, I'm done experimenting and I'm just on this path, I'm just gonna like put my blinders on because that's not how things move ahead. That's not how the company was founded, right? If, if, if Aaron didn't just go talk to this, this nice fellow who she had no idea who he was at the time, then there would be no company, right? If I didn't respond to this guy in IRC, then it wouldn't be deployed, our so software wouldn't be deployed across one of the 10 largest software companies in the world. And so you have to be in those positions. And the second you, you stop t tinkering, you stop hacking, um, you stop innovating, you mm -hmm. can't do that. I really agree with you. I think having that side project, doesn't matter if you're you know, a founder or even a VC, I think is super important because I don't know how you really understand where the world's going if you're not actually, you know, A, curious about where it's going and B, using it. Yeah reading about a technology is not adequate. Yeah, and I think that you need to experiment with lots of things. There's a uh, very famous ex-CEO who said that he wouldn't try one uh, vendor's phone because he wanted to keep his mind clear. I think that's crazy. I mean, you've got to try everything, right? You've got to, you've got to try different languages. You've got to try different things. He used to be my boss. <laughs> I didn't know where that came from. <laughs> well, Tony, it's been great to have you on Founder Stories. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time.